Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. Threat Connect is the industry's most widely adopted threat intelligence platform. Built to unite the people, processes, and technologies across your security team, your organization, and your entire ecosystem of partners. Threat Connect's threat intelligence platform enables your team to collaborate, analyze, and make sense of threat data all in one place. Empower your team towards fast and efficient analysis that leads to decisive action. Transform your entire threat detection and response program today. Claim your free account at threatconnect.com forward slash security weekly. Faraday is an open source collaborative pen test and vulnerability management platform. With real time dashboards and more than 50 tools, Faraday allows seamless integration with your security workflow, allowing CISOs and pen testers to see in real time the impact and risks uncovered from assessments. Scan your network every day using different tools and get one click reports. Creating a collaborative experience, sharing knowledge, and making pen testing fun again. This is Faraday. Visit FaradaySec.com for more information. Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly. This is our technical segment for this evening, how to block ads and malware using Bind DNS. You may ask why this tech segment? How did this come to fruition? Well, first, of course, ads are annoying. And websites like Forbes.com and Wired.com, when you go there with an ad blocker enabled in your browser, throw up this message and say, hey, you can register with us and then we'll uh, maybe still show you the ads. How does that work? You register with them and then you can run an ad blocker, I think is the way some of them work, but you have to register with them, probably so they can send you spam messages from the people that advertise with them, which I just think is atrocious. Um, and malware is also, well, of course, bad. And I'll talk about some interesting things I found uh, in the relationship between ad serving domains and malware domains. Um, P of Sense, of course, was the subject of last week's technical segment, and P of Sense has the capability to do a, a, a DNS blacklist. It's in the PI, what is that module? We're gonna have the author on the show. He messaged me on Twitter. It's awesome. Um, Joff, Joff is on the phone. Um, Anyway, I, I feel bad because the author messaged me on Twitter, but we're gonna have him on the show to talk about his module for uh, uh, blocking stuff via DNS and other things in PFSense. The thing is PFSense wanted to be my DNS server in order to do that. I am a nerd and I like to have DNS and DHCP servers on my network, have them be separate systems in little small embedded devices that I customize and control myself. So. I built my own DNS and DHCP servers. I built a pair for the studio here. I'm gonna do another pair for home. Um, so here are my interesting uh, kind of facts. Um, so I found overlap between the ad blocking lists and the malware blocking lists. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was like, what? I'm like, that is an interesting finding in and of itself. And the reason I stumbled across that is because Bind's DNS server complains really loudly if you try and load two zones that are exactly the same. <laughs> and it was like, no, 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 you can't do that. And I'm like, why is there over? I'm like, wow, okay. So I fixed that by writing a crappy shell script, uh, which I put in the show notes, wiki.securityweekly.com. Uh, the entry for episode 472 has my crappy little shell script, which you are, feel free to, to steal and do whatever you want with it, uh, it's, that's fine. Um, so I created two DNS and DHCP servers uh, these were for the network here in the studio. Um, the DHCP range is split between them, so there's full failover, so one can die completely. Ideally, you put those in two physical locations on two separate UPSs. I'm working on that. Um, the, the cigar club next door doesn't have a UPS, so <laughs> I'm like, anyway, we'll get them there, uh, and then we'll have two separate physical locations have uh, the DNS and DHCP, which is important. Um, they are, in fact, caching name servers as well, which helps everyone. I, you know, probably most of us listening to the show is like, yeah, I'm gonna have my own DNS server. It's kind of like I built my own firewall and I built my own DNS and DHCP servers. It's one of those things that you should do. Mine point to Google 8.8.8.8 and 8.8.4.4. I don't know, Jack, if you've got other recommendations there, but. <sighs> Is it, is so, it, does so it it how much is it? I mean, you're giving Google more information about your browsing habits. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, I mean, you yeah. can go Open DNS. I wanted more control over my blacklist. Open DNS is certainly an option. Great. You get a web login. You can, you, you yeah, can add block right. lists through them. That's yeah, fine too. I kind of want to do it myself. Right. Just because. You, and you can. Um, 
why not just talk directly to the root DNS servers and, and have your own infrastructure? Yeah. I mean, That's there's lots of free, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you can point to the roots. You can also just... I was just lazy and pointing to Google, basically. Google's, Google's fine. I, right. I just throw that out there because if, if it is a concern some people have. We just talked about paying attention to DNS. Google obviously pays attention to that. Oh. Right, right. They do. You, the one, the one place that you will rarely want to point anything is to your ISP's DNS because yeah, do it that. is a cost center. It's every now and then you'll find an crappy. ISP that cares about DNS, and mm -hmm. it's because they have asked their support desk what they have for avoidable calls, and mm -hmm. somebody in support said, "You know, if our DNS didn't suck, our call volume would collapse." Yep. But that's rare. Right. So I pointed towards yeah, Google. Good, good um, now, you can add more DNS block lists. I used Google to find block lists. Lenny Zeltzer had a, an article, and I pointed oh, yeah. some references in the show notes. I mean, there's lots of information if you just Google search for DNS block lists. Um, oh, I, plus one for Lenny, by the way. That's an excellent That was a great article. post, right? Yeah. Um, I hate DHCP, CD, and DNS mask, which is what comes default on the Raspbian installation in a lot of embedded systems. I think I'm scarred from the WRT54G era when I was working a lot with DNS mask. It's, it's, I, I just, it's fine if you want to run it and you want to, you can configure it to do the same thing. I'm just more at home with the ISC bind and ISC DHCP server, so that's what I did. Um, so I bought two Raspberry Pi 3s uh, Revision B, is that how did I say that right? Model B, Model B. Uh, systems, which are pretty pretty nice systems. They've actually come along. Raspberry Pis have come a long way. They're pretty beefy little systems. I put the micro SD cards in there. I put Raspbian on that. I didn't include that as a technical segment because most people can figure out that listening to the show probably already know how to do that. Um, so I, I cut right to the chase. Um, putting I ordered them on Amazon, by the way, for 50 bucks a piece, and it came with a power supply and a case. Uh, to me, that was just easy, whatever. 50 bucks a piece was worth it for me. I have this crappy little uh, shell script that I wrote that I'm sure some people are going to be like, oh, you probably could have done this better and saved a command, which is fine. Please send that to me, psw at securityweekly.com. Yep, yep. Send us your feedback. But this was my crappy little shell script. I basically define a bunch of variables. Um, I get the ad list from one website, which is yoyo.org, and I get the malware list from malwaredomains.com. So those were the kind of the two standard ones that I found uh, out there to get the, I mean, and you could do lots of research into which blacklist you choose. I chose those two. Like I said, you can add more. You can add as many as you want. Um, I think the important part is to put the shell script on uh, a cron job so that it continually updates uh, your zones, which is important, which is why I put it in a shell script so they could run it on a cron job. Um, I define the files. You know, I download those to a file. I found that... Um, the files from the malwaredomains.com website come with the Windows uh, carriage trend line feed. So I got a little sed command that strips that out. And then I run this glorious uh, awk to sort to unique, which I'm sure Joff could do in Python way better. But I run awk um, and sort in unique. Basically what that command does is it creates a unique listing of zone file definitions that I'm going to tell Bind to go ahead and read. And that's what that command. That was the best way I could find to create a unique listing, um, was to just run it in one command like that. Um, so basically, I take the domain, and then I build the appropriate variables for Bind to define the master file. Uh, so I say it's type master in the file. So I build my Bind configuration, and I just take the domain from the uh, list that I download, and then I run it through sort and I run it through unique. That was the best solution I could come up with to come up with a unique list of domains. So, um, so quick question, Paul. Yeah. Uh, with, with your output um, bind configuration file, um, are you, what are you resolving um, the bad domains to? Yeah, good question. So next in my technical segment, I have a file in Etsy bind called null zone. And I am resolving them to localhost, 2127.0.0.1. Ah, very good, very good. So and it's, it's a good question, Joff, because there are blog posts on the internet, um, and I link to one, that have you start a web server with, like, light HTTPD and put a one-byte, like, image file that doesn't contain anything. So you basically can 
resolve it to a web server that's going to serve up a one byte image file that is like nothing. Or you could put a message there or something, in, you could create a small image file that just says this ad has been removed. So that's a good point, Jeff. There is some flexibility there. I just resolved it to localhost because that's the quick and easy way to do it. But you can set up a web, now you have to make sure that web server, if the web server is not running, you're gonna get a 404 anytime you load an ad. Um, speed wise, I don't know, there's minute differences between localhost. Depends on the web operating server serving system. an image or a the client, right? The client yeah. operating system makes a difference too, and I forget which yeah. it is, but uh, because there's a difference, what it, uh, back, back when I used to work for a living, yeah. Mm. Used to do the, yeah. Mm. So some, yeah, so, some so one clients, of the things. Tr yeah, treat 127.001 differently. Some clients know not to try to look up against that, and some clients will try to look up against that. Mm -hmm. And that was a decade ago when I, last time I ran anything. So pain of it. Never mind. <clears throat> so, Never yeah, mind. one of the things that occurs to me might be an interesting extension to this is to resolve it to a real address inside your LAN. Yes. And to make that system do something interesting. Now, something interesting, in my opinion, that I've been meaning to investigate myself, and this might be, this might be a good future exercise for all of us, is just have a box that listens on all TCP ports. Um, and, um, and maybe even UDP, but mm, that, that's, you know, not much as UDP out there anyway. Uh, and just have that box syslog if it gets a connection and where it got the connection. That's true. Yeah. So you could uh, catch a potentially malicious advertisement, right? Yeah. It's just a basic mm. little honeypot activity. I like that. Um, job. that might be a, a really neat, and again, it's something you could implement on a, on a Raspberry Very Pi. Pie. I'm yeah. li listening on. A listing on all TCP ports is uh, a little bit of a trick because you have mm. to tell the, the Linux kernel uh, to increase the file descriptors. Uh, I've actually done this before. It's it's a bit of a trick. But once you get it right, um, you could have a very basic little honey, honey net pot, going yeah. on. Yeah, honey yeah pot. if something tries to connect to not port 80, you could log an alert, and it would be potentially interesting traffic. Right. I like and, that. And, yeah. and even log the traffic. Mm. You know, like even that. just log, log whatever it sends, you know. Um, so then in your name d.conf.local file, I include my blacklist file, which I built. And then your blacklist file basically says there's a zone for this domain. It's a master and it points it to your local uh, file that basically points the ad domain to local host. And that's it. And you're done. One of the earliest and probably most famous articles uh, on this topic that was written in, hold on, when did he write this? Hal Pomerantz wrote this in like 2003 or something ridiculous like that. Um, I don't know where, it, it doesn't say the date that he did this, but he did this a long time ago. And 2003, yeah, I can tell because the uh, serial number in his, uh, in, in his local domain is 2003. Uh, so he wrote the article on how to do this. It's since been extended. A lot of people doing things like Joff uh, suggested as well. It's since been extended, and there's a lot of lot more ad blocking and malware domains that um, you can get out there. So Hal's original article talked about blocking advertising, and a lot of other blog posts talk about you know blocking malware domains or basically any domain grouping that you want to block. Similar to the way OpenDNS works, except you're picking and choosing and able to do it on your own. Um, and again, I did it with, with Bind, in a, um, with Bind uh, specifically. Uh, and I linked to some blog posts uh, that I used as a reference for doing that. I kind of like took pieces and parts from multiple people's blog posts to, to put this together. So it was a great exercise. I, I mean, I noticed it was a great performance improvement uh, in browsing the web. And just the fact that there's a load split between two servers that are now running clean. Before everyone here in this local network in the office was pointing to Verizon's router for, DN for DHCP. Right. I was pointing out to the internet for a lot of uh, right. the DNS stuff. I, doing it locally is just so it, much one better. One of the things that I notice in doing ad blocking at the network level, because a lot of people are like, ah, I use, I use you know, uh, endpoint protection things and mm. I you know, have extensions for my you know, ad block extensions for the browsers yeah. is, first of all, it doesn't, they're imperfect, but uh, where I notice the differences on mobile devices, 
Mm. Because the world's just happier yes. when I'm at the house and on uh, and on my network where those things are largely blocked. Yes. And then you go out and you're like, why is why is Verizon so slow? Why is Sprint so? Oh, it's because I haven't well, found ad blockers. I haven't found yeah. ad blockers that like you know block ads in the free apps because I'm too cheap to give somebody yes. 99 cents and what. It's like no, the world's just happier or when, when you when block you, it all. But when you're <laughs> in the apps such as Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, when you click a link, a lot of times, I think in all three of those cases, on Android or iOS, it puts you in an internal web browser right. that does not have ad blocking capability. Right, exactly, which is, which is yeah. why if you protect the whole network, Right. Um, you're protected. It, on you're your protecting mobile. from Not only that. Those your mobile experience things. is faster, like you're saying. Right. Yeah. The mobile's like, oh wow, look. Right. You know, right. The yeah, website's I, low. I have a. I have a question. I haven't experimented with this personally, but I wonder what you guys think of this. If you're resolving to one twenty seven zero zero one, and then you know your your browser attempts to connect to let's say port eighty on one twenty seven zero zero one, um, you know is is that going to slow things down, or does the browser just not attempt to connect? Have you looked? Have you looked at that, Paul? Um, that, that, I think, is, goes back to the... It gets a... Um, well, if you re return the result of... It just gets a TCP reset, probably. Get, I was just going to say, I, it gets a TCP reset job, which is pretty fast. It, it's quick enough that, that yeah. you don't notice. Now, if you were um, to, to firewall that in some way, then you would, you would know pretty quickly that something hokey is going on. But, Correct. Yeah, so um, it's probably in a more mixed environment Let's say I've got a fire. I mean, I don't know if you would firewall the local host on port 80. Probably not. But in a mixed environment, it might make sense to point it to an internal web server right. that tells you why your content's not showing up. Right. And I, I probably should do that here because it is a mixed environment. Right. And people may wonder why, you know, certain content's not showing up. At least I can tell them, hey, right. this right. is, I could put an image. A lot of people create an image, very, very, very small image that is basically text that says your ad's been blocked, contact your administrator or whatever. So Yeah, whatever I mean, that so too. that also speaks to the idea that I had. Now I'm going to build something, of course. Yeah. Uh, which right. is to build the little honeypot. Uh, and as part of the little honeypot, if it is a TCP 80 or TCP 443, like you said, go ahead and deliver some little image back that yes. says, you know, this is ad blocked uh, and, and make it, you know, make it fairly quick. Um, but also on on a box that's listening to all ports, d not only listen to the initial transaction coming from the client and log it, then go ahead and close the socket, send it a reset. Correct, correct. Um, so that it's rapid and and, and yeah. So, yeah, like mm. at home, I blocked porn sites, and when you go to a potential porn site and through Open DNS. I put an image, and it's like me pointing at you going, uh-uh-uh. <laughs> oh, but Paul, what do you do for your own late-night surfing, then? I have my own DNS server that I point to, so I can pass <laughs> porn at home. <laughs> and when my family or my kids figure that out, I will give them a high five, because that will be awesome. Like, I can't <laughs> wait for that day when it's I really realize, like, my son's bypassing my security measures. and like, that's A+, plus, dude, that's awesome. Man, I, I love where you're going with that, because... I've got a system in the house that I've, I've run for a long time where I shut my kid's internet off at, mm -hmm. at, uh, at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning because he was getting very – this is teenage stuff, right? Mm. Poor discipline. Um, but I, I told him years ago – I mean this has been several years ago. I said, you figure this out, then you're cool. Go ahead and surf the net. Right, And it's right. been probably four or five years and he hasn't figured it out yet. So, uh, We did get a request along those lines of how you – can you block content within a specific site like YouTube? And YouTube, YouTube. is typically the offender. Now, we, we've been the victim of having our YouTube channels shut down because they flagged us as potentially malicious or pornography-related material because our show is called – one of our other shows is called Hacking <laughs> TV. Um, but how do you block content within YouTube on some of these, uh, you know, open source style systems? So we'll be it, tackling that's, that. That always freaks me because there's there is nothing on the internet more obscene than the comments on YouTube. So don't don't focus on the videos. Like, could could you block the comment? Yeah, like Gee, yeah. The, the world would be a better. There's there's that's a project. There's the DNS yes. list. I never <laughs> want to see YouTube comments ever, ever again. again. I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I, I, I haven't thought about are the, are the, 
There's a it setting in our be, channel. I could block them in our own channel. We go. Uh, uh, we have an approval system. We approve yeah, yeah, comments right, 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 on, our, on our channels. Right, but, but it's just. I don't want to read comments if, about if you, it. Oh, God. If, you, if you ever make the mistake of having faith in humanity, oh. just read the comments. Well, so <laughs> sometimes I'll go on YouTube and I'll try and find videos of like my kung fu forms. Like if I forget a form. I can. It takes a while, but sometimes I can, because a lot of the forms are the same name, but they're totally different than what I learned. But sometimes I find that one video, and I'm like, oh, cool, I found it, and I can use it to jog my memory. And then I'm like, I wonder what people are saying about this. And then I'm like, oh, no, no down the no, rat hole. No, no, no. Debate about which martial art is better no, and whether this yes. person would win in a fight. Yeah, over. Yeah. Like, against, well, if that yeah. guy in the video fought Bruce Lee, he Bruce, would lose. Yeah, oh, if it's God. Bruce Lee and he just went ahead and he just popped oh. the lid on right. Pandora's box. Right. Oh, it's right. Right. Is it Bruce just, Lee versus <laughs> Bugs Bunny, yeah, <laughs> and just it's about that logical. That's the level of logic. This although they form take has so no seriously. practical application. I'm like, oh my god, I can't. I just, 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 just no, no, it's not no, about that. No, stop. No, it's like, it's just, hey, uh, <sighs> just while, while we're on the topic, um, if people go to Lenny's link, uh, which is a really nice compilation, I gotta of add that. Stuff. I gotta add that to the show notes, John. Oh, good. Yeah, do do, do that. Um, a, a friend of ours in the industry, John Bambanek, has some yeah. really good pages there. And, Paul, you probably ran across them. Uh, they're both uh, command and control domains as well as uh, domain generation algorithm domains that he maintains. Mm -hmm. uh, some really good stuff there. I, and I'm sure John won't mind me uh, giving him a shout-out on that. But it's it's really good stuff. So if you're looking for some high-quality feeds, uh, John Bambanek's stuff is good. Malware Domains is good. Um, D Shield is good. Uh, Johanna yeah, Solrich stuff list is good. Um, so there's a lot of interesting sources out there that you can leverage. Yeah. And so uh, you really um, can't go wrong. If you go to zeltzer.com, Z E L T S E R.com, he has a blog post that's called Block Lists of Suspected Malicious IPs and URLs. And in there, it's kind of a mix mash of free, commercial, non commercial. List. And some of, the, some of those links are actually broken, but most of them are good. Most of them are good, and some of it is by IP address, some of it is by DNS name, and some of it is by URL. So it's kind of a mashup of the, the three, but he published that on uh, February of this year, so it's one of the more updated resources on some of the lists to look for out there, and that's on zeltzer.com. Very cool. Sweet. We're going to take a short break, come back with security news for this week, so stay tuned. Don't go anywhere.